Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Tessa Hicks Peterson. I am your illustrious MC for the evening's program. Um, I am also the director of the CASA program and I'm a lucky lady who gets to teach the wonderful students you're going to hear from today and also work with the community organizations that we partner with in Ontario. Can everyone hear me? Give me some thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay. Sonia, I think it's just you if you can't hear us. I'm so sorry to say. You might need to log back in and on. Um, so everyone who's here with us, I invite you to put on your cameras if you feel so bold. If you cannot, I understand. If you can, then you can look into the eyes of our students as they're presenting and that'll make them feel way less nervous, I'm sure. Um, so I'm gonna give you just a quick overview about our program for those of you who don't know who are guests with us today. Um, CASA stands for Critical Action and Social Advocacy. It's a community engagement program and community-based research program out of Pitzer College. Uh, we have a community center in downtown Ontario, just a few minutes from Pitzer's campus. Of course, normally we would all be there together, breaking bread and um, having good cheer together in person. But as all things in 2020, we're doing it differently and we're glad perhaps this is more accessible for more people that we are doing it by Zoom. Um, so invite many family members and friends and folks who are coming in to join us today. Um, at CASA, as you probably know, we have students who work in partnership with local community organizations on a variety of different social justice issues. They work very hard for many, many hours over the course of the semester, about 100 hours, working on internship projects and community-based research to support and accompany the work of our community partners. Um, so we're really excited that we get to work with such incredible organizations um, in our area and that our students, regardless of being spread all over the globe, are able to still be engaged and do so in a really beautiful and robust manner. We've had a wonderful class together this semester. Um, I wanna shout out to my um, com comadre uh, colleague, Jessica Chares, who works here at CASA. Jessica, you wanna give a little shout out uh, if you have any complaints, send them to her. Just kidding. If you have any tech needs or anything like that, you can let her know. Um, she's going to be posting some links and different things in the chat as we go along so you can see what she's talking about. Um, so we are going to kick this off with um, students who are showing just brief presentations about the research they've been doing. Um, if you have questions afterwards pertaining to their specific project, you can ask them um, and then we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. Um, so, any questions or anything before we jump right in? All right, let's get to it. Let's get this party started. This is going to be a very fun time to hear about this beautiful work of these wonderful students. I'm so proud of them. I've been teaching in the CASA program for 15 years as a cultural studies professor at Pitzer, and I have to say this has been one of the hardest semesters probably that we've all endured, um, and these students have just risen to the occasion and done beautiful work, and I'm really, really honored to be a part of their journey. So first up, we have Ada Cohen, Lincoln Pentel, and Sonia Hadley, who have been working in partnership with Riverside, All of Us or None, on Starting Over Inc. They will tell you about all of that. Ada, you ready to rock it? Okay, let's go. Everyone give it up. You can uh, do some snaps. You can do some claps. You can even take yourself off mute and do a holler if you wanted to, but uh, we're going to let Ada go. Take it away. All righty. I am going to share my screen really quickly, so hopefully our technology will work with us. Um, all righty. So I had, okay, so hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Ada Cohen. I am a junior at Pitzer College and I interned with Starting Over Inc. this semester. Um, so, just a quick overview, Starting Over Inc. provides transitional housing units and re-entry services um, for those during incarcer incarceration, but primarily towards the tail end of the day inside Riverside County Jails and post-incarceration. They are also the umbrella organization for Riverside All of Us or None, which is a national organization that has local chapters led by formerly incarcerated folks. Um, my project with Starting Over Inc. this semester was to establish a support line, which is a take on the word hotline, 
And so the goals of this support line are to amplify the voices of those on the inside of these jails, um, to more effectively support family and friends of those incarcerated in Riverside County jails, and to better advocate th for those via uh, court support and civic engagement, and to also introduce them to starting over Inc's re-entry services upon their release. So we think that a support line is a good way to tackle these issues um, because if we can centralize and streamline our communication, then this will lead to more communication. Um, and if we can have more communication, then we can provide more in-depth oversight for over the sheriff's department. We can help those affected by it better navigate the COVID-19 crisis inside the Riverside jails. Um, we can eliminate barriers of communication between the inside and the outside, of which there are many. And we can add, like, essentially, any re-entry resource in the Inland Empire is a positive. So my research this semester took on two parts. I had my literature review, and then I conducted interviews and surveys. The literature I was looking at was trying to find other support lines that we would like to imitate and proving why there is a need in Riverside County specifically. Um, I had the immense fortune of interviewing two of Starting Over Inc's clients and friends, and I was also able to post surveys to social media, um, and we got a good turnout on those. Um, so that was my research, um, but I also was doing projects with Starting Over Inc that included setting up the actual phone number, um, organizing the information of active and inactive cases, and making an instruction manual for what to do when we receive calls. And the goal of this manual was essentially like, anyone who wants to work on the support line, we hope that they can read this document and get to work right away. I also made a short video, which I will share now, essentially launching the support line. So, um, I'm going to play it, and if you can't hear it, stop me and let me know, um, <laughs> but here we go. During the pandemic, he came down with the virus, and he wound up having going into almost a light coma. He was with uh, three other boys. They were all infected. They were not going to test my son before releasing him. He couldn't get out of his town. He didn't have phone calls. And then he said it sounded like a horror movie and that uh, for five days he was in the hospital and they was there for me, um, making sure everything was all right. The people were screaming. So once he got out of the coma and out of the cancer care, they moved him straight out the hospital and put him in the holding tank downtown Riverside for five days, taking everything, like giving them his medicine. I have a compromised immune system. I have lupus, so you cannot send my son home because we have to test him before releasing him. You have a, a responsibility. That's why I like all the kids. I can I can hear the depression. I can I can hear that he was dead. So I gave him to you healthy, so you need to give him back to me healthy. I told uh, Ella about what they stored to my son that they made calls, and that same night. They took him out of the hole and they gave him his medication and fed him. And they call and check on me. You know, they don't hear from me or see me on Facebook. They call, check, and ask how I'm doing, 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 how i am doing 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 how i am doing
sorry guys, my computer, there we go. <laughs> um, all righty. So yeah, so just wrapping up, um, we have everything in place to launch the support line. We just need to get it out there into the community. Um, and some long-term goals is we would love for this to be a live hotline um, so that you can have, you know, an actual person pick up the phone. At the moment, you leave a message and we will get back to you. Um, and we would also love to be able to take collect calls inside um, the jails. Unfortunately, both of these things take personnel and money. Um, so those are long-term goals that we would love to see happen. Um, as for myself, I've been so appreciative of the opportunity to work at Starting Over Inc. Um, in my opinion, this organization is just truly community-led, which is something that I think we all can strive for. Um, and it just confirmed that this is the type of work that I really want to be doing. So a huge thank you to Tessa and Jessica at CASA, to Jordana and Avalon in Starting Over Inc., and to our beautiful class that we can see here in the bottom left corner. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce Lincoln, who will share his project with you next. He um, worked at looking at the Riverside County budget, specifically the Sheriff's Department budget, which is incredibly integral work um, for the support line, as the Sheriff's Department is the one who is running all of the Riverside County jails. So thank you so much. And Lincoln, on to you. Let me know if you guys could see my screen or not. Perfect. Perfect, here you, we go. And you guys could hear me, correct? Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ada. Uh, my name is Lincoln Pantel and I am a senior at Pitzer College. Uh, I also interned at Starting Over Inc, specifically the All of Us or None Riverside chapter. Uh, and the focus of my project was to design a survey for Riverside County residents. Uh, and with this survey, we will collect and analyze the results and the priorities to present to the Board of Supervisors uh, in, a, in anticipation for uh, next year's uh, annual budget. Introduction. I mean, Ada did a, a really great job introducing both organizations. Um, but since 2004, Starting Over pursues in providing transitional housing and reentry uh, re services, while also helping build strong communities through recovery, civic engagement, and leadership development. Uh, Riverside All of Us Are None is a local chapter of All of Us Are None and it's part of a national organizing initiative of current and formerly incarcerated people. And they are organized to action to end uh, mass incarceration and the discrimination faced by formerly incarcerated people. I mentioned both organizations because the Riverside chapter of All of Us or None operates under the direction of Starting Over Inc., which is led uh, by a core team of the uh, starting over ink uh, uh, people. Research. Throughout uh, the semester, I did research on Riverside County Sheriff's Department budget. I collected data on their budget over the last 10 years. Uh, I also did research on how other CBOs like People's Budget LA, uh, Protect People's Budget for Santa Clara, and I looked at how they designed their People's Budget and I collected data on the budgets for county service programs over the last 10 years as well. And then I lastly, I did research on the best practices for distributing the survey. Let's see. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, methods. 
So I, the methods I used was I interviewed uh, residents of the Riverside County um, and also focus groups. Also uh, participated in field observation um, at the, the Board of Supervisors listening sessions. Uh, I was also a participant observer at monthly Riverside All of Us or None meetings. And I also did get to volunteer at uh, an annual backpack giveaway uh, for an event for Riverside All of Us or None. And here are some of my uh, research findings for the Riverside County Sheriff's Department budget. Uh, in the fiscal year of uh, 2019 uh, to 2020, Riverside County Sheriff's Department received over $300 million from the country. Uh, the recommended budget for fiscal year uh, 2020 to 2021 included a 3% increase. And despite the calls for residents for care, um, Supervisor Spiegel, Hewitt, and Jeffries voted uh, in favor for increase in an increase in funding by 17 million, which is crazy. And instead of listening to the community for increased funding for housing, public health, police funding, the Board of Supervisors will, uh, will be increasing the budget to, to $351 million, and which is, which is crazy. And one thing to keep note is that when I was going through the documents to find out the budget, uh, it was really comprehensive and it seemed like it like they did this on purpose so it's hard for the public to identify the actual expenditures that are going to policing activities how others cbo's design people's budget uh, before creating the survey for the residents i had to research on how other community-based organizations design their people's budget so i got to take a look at like about five different uh, people's budgets for similar uh, counties. And I found out that the best way to reach out through the residents is through participatory budgeting. And in order to reach out to the people, the best way is to create a uh, survey, which would help uh, solicit input of the people who reside in their priorities. Um, a website and social media campaign is also very important to reach out to the residents, especially with the uh, whole coronavirus pandemic and, every, uh, and with the new age of technology. Um, hashtags are also really important for the campaigns. For example, the People's Budget LA hashtag was, was top on Twitter for a while. And lastly, for internet search volume in California, People's Budget LA uh, trends alongside LA City Council and the mayor of LA based on the social media volume, which boosts uh, those searches as well. Community needs. Um, despite the board's approval of this recommended budget, there's still time to make our voices heard. And instead of giving the Sheriff's Department um, a budget increase, the community of Riverside has called for increased funding for housing uh, public health, education, and other public services. Um, and with the data from uh, the listening sessions and the meetings, uh, Riverside uh, County uh, residents uh, want to invest in universal needs like uh, community resources and environment, human needs, reimagine community safety, and economic assistance uh, instead of um, investing in more uh, police activities. And then right here is a couple slides of the survey that uh, we will be launching within the next month. And I just want to say thank you to Starting Over and Riverside all of us are none for the opportunity of a lifetime to work with you guys. I also wanna thank uh, Professor Tessa, Jessica, and the rest of the CASA class. That, uh, uh, there are no words to express my deep gratitude for you guys. And it was such an honor and pleasure uh, to take uh, this class with you guys. And uh, now I'll pass it on to Sonia. And she'll be talking about how her research 
on why Riverside County uh, needs to close jails and shift its uh, sheriff's department funding into more uh, community-based resources. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lincoln. Oh my God, Lincoln, thank you. Oh, that was amazing. Unbelievable. I'm having trouble. Um, here, here we go. There we go. All you, Sonia. Awesome. Thank you so much. You did an awesome job. Um, I'm on experiencing some technical difficulties, so I'm on my mom's computer, and I don't exactly know how to work it, so bear with me, but um, thank you so much, Lincoln, and um, my name is Sonia, um, and I also interned with Starting Over Inc. and Riverside Officer Nun this semester, um, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, my project focused on the cost of jails on Riverside County specifically and why the county needs to close jails and shift funding away from the sheriff's department and into community-based resources. Um, so it connects really well to what Lincoln just presented. So um, I wanted to start by giving an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to give a little background about the project and the process, go into the cost of jails, um, some solutions, and some next steps. So to start with the background, Lincoln and Ada both gave you wonderful um, backgrounds on the organization, so I'll keep moving. Um, but in terms of my methodology, um, there was four main aspects, the first of which was archival research of sheriff records through Public Re Records Act requests. And that included looking at budgets, um, looking at policies and other documents of those natures. Um, I also conducted interviews with formerly incarcerated residents of starting over um, and attended the Board of Supervisor listening sessions um, and incorporated, incorporated those as well. Um, and also uh, participated in participant observation at Riverside all of us are known organizing meetings. Um, and this is just a quote that guided me throughout my research process and that I think is really important um, to the discussion of jail closures and reimagining. And it's from Patrice Colors, and it reads, someone imagined handcuffs, someone imagined guns, someone imagined a jail cell. Let's imagine something different. Yes, and so in terms of the cost of jails, um, I wanted to start by acknowledging the really deep personal cost that incarceration has on our um, community members. And so this is a quote from a resident of Starting Over um, that reads, incarceration takes away your hope or dreams or self-esteem. And that, that really speaks to the much deeper costs um, of incarceration beyond what we can measure in terms of financial um, costs. Really, the costs are so much deeper. Um, and uh, other examples of this here, um, oh, Sorry, I really don't know how to use this computer. Um, other examples of this here um, that speak to the deeper natures of incarceration are uh, the impacts on mental health. Um, incarceration can worsen self-esteem and health. Um, it can cause disconnection um, from the community and from and that causes trouble re-entering society after incarceration because of the ways that uh, society keeps developing after. Um, Incarceration causes trauma, uh, long lasting trauma, and can cause strains on relationships with family members and support networks. Um, it also leaves a long lasting stigma on people um, who have experienced incarceration that can also lead to discrimination and barriers to re-entry, including um, difficulty accessing jobs and difficulty accessing housing, among many other things. And so this is another quote from a resident of Starting Over that reads, all those years I was in prison, I didn't learn responsibility because they gave me a bed, they gave me food, I wasn't paying rent, I didn't have responsibilities. And it's kind of sad to think you're 40 years old and you're barely, barely growing up, barely starting to live life on life's terms. And this speaks to the costs that come along with re-entry. So these are other added costs um, in terms of the resources that um, we need to provide to be able to help people re-enter into society after um, 
all the harm that incarceration does cause that we saw previously. Um, and so these are just more added costs. And then in terms of the financial cost of incarceration, um, Riverside County just built a new jail that cost um, $376 million. This jail um, had a net crease of jail capacity for the entire county of 1,273 beds and is now the largest project ever constructed in Riverside. Um, and this, furthermore, this jail expansion was completely unnecessary. If you look at the data um, and look at Riverside County's average daily jail population, um, it has been steadily decreasing since 2014. Um, and yet, even though the jails were already under capacity prior to the expansion, um, this jail, this new jail has um, expanded the overall capacity by 32% um, in Riverside. And so this graph shows um, the, the trends of sentence versus non sentence people um, within the Riverside jail population. And so as you can see, um, since 2005, it's been steadily increasing the percentage of um, non sentenced people in jails, which means that they have not yet been convicted of crime and by US law are technically seen as innocent um, under the law. And so um, just another way to look at this is, as you can see here, almost 80% of people in Riverside jails are non sentenced. Um, and so this just further emphasizes the how unnecessary jail expansion is, and how important um, reducing jail capacity is in Riverside. So in terms of solutions, um, as Lincoln mentioned, there were Board of Supervisor listening sessions to hear about budget priorities. And out of over 150 comments, the top three themes brought up were systemic racism and inequity, funding for social services and public safety and criminal justice reform, all of which have to do with um, incarceration in, River in Riverside County. And so the main solution that I suggest is closing Blythe Jail and Robert Presley Detention Centers. This alone would um, free up over $45 million in the general fund that could be channeled into housing, mental health care, and community-based services. And in addition to closing the jail, we also need to work on decarcerating our county. As we can see, we have overrepresented um, non populations in our jails. And we also need to work on repealing quality of life laws that just that target people for um, for things like homelessness and poverty. Um, and we need to start treating those with care and not with incarceration. We also need to invest in reentry programs, as we've heard from directly impacted people. Reentry is really difficult and people need support. Um, and we need to continue to invest in those services and also invest in community resources and alternatives that keep people out of incarceration altogether. So in terms of next steps, um, this research was compiled um, just to provide information to starting over in Riverside all of student none, so that if the directly impacted organizers choose to do so, it could be used to urge the Board of Supervisors to shift money away from criminalization and towards community-based care. And so some ways to do that um, are to continue doing storytelling, continue uplifting the voices of the most directly impacted people, um, doing further research, areas of which could include the environmental impacts of jails on Riverside County, quality of life laws that we should repeal, and the conditions inside. Um, and also in my research, I won't go into it too much now, but um, I included a section about movement building. So if the directly impacted organizers decide that this is something that they'd want to pursue. Um, I just included some preliminary research that would um, contribute to that. And so that is my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and thank you so much to the organizations. Um, and I also just wanted to give an overview of how the three of us, Ada, Lincoln, and I's presentations um, combine and really um, Work, 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 work towards the overall um, missions of Riverside Olive and starting over. 
So Ada talked about phone line support, which really speaks to starting over um, dedication to supporting um, incarcerated people and formerly incarcerated people and their families and um, the importance of supporting people currently who are inside. Um, then it connects to Lincoln who talked the sheriff's budget and how we can start to shift money away um, from the overall spending on the sheriff, which contributes to the um, incarceration in our county. And then I connected it to where we're going next, hopefully, which is starting to close jails, getting that money shifted away through tangible steps um, and contributing to organizing work of directly impacted people um, through Riverside all of us are none. So thank you so much and yeah, <laughs> yay everyone. Thank you so much, Ada, Lincoln, and Sonia for that incredible work. Um, as we have uh, Avalon here with us today and she is a former Pitzer student and, and now works with the organizations that she's overseeing these Pitzer uh, interns and we uh, appreciate Avalon your support and your kind words here that this research makes a difference and, um, and we can tell it's really profound work. So thank you all so much. Yeah, you all see the comments, you're making a difference in the world and we really appreciate that. Um, if there's not any uh, questions right now, then I will go through to our next um, folks and then maybe we can do questions at the end as well if there's things come up as we go along. Um, so Aditi Maddock and Layla Kent will be speaking to you next about the Warehouse Workers Resource Center. Take it away, Aditi. And don't forget to unmute. Um, no, I'm not on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so Layla and I actually did a joint project, and so she'll... Uh, be starting with the first one just to give an overview of what our research project was um, and what we're doing um, as a community offering and then uh, I'll be uh, giving kind of my presentation before she goes on to hers. Okay lovely. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Layla. I am a current Scripps junior and I had the incredible opportunity to work with the Warehouse Workers Resource Center which is a labor adv advocacy organization here in the Inland Empire that is working to improve the working conditions within the warehouse industry. So WWRC largely works to support workers who are dealing with issues like health and safety, wage theft, workers comp, or workplace retaliation. And recently they launched a membership program which focuses more on creating a community-based network or creating a community base within this community. So the So sorry about that. Um, so those who have access to the membership program have access to a broad variety of programs such as Escuelita, public health resources, amazing legal and organizing support as well as uh, civic engagement programs. And Aditi and I both worked on the launch of a youth centered civic engagement program which will focus on providing um, civic education towards workers, families, and community members. So for our research project, we both focused on healing and well-being support. However, we focused on different concentrations within that topic. So I'll pass it off to Aditi to talk a little bit about the specifics of our internship project. And then, yeah, we'll go from there. You're on mute. I am so sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Layla. Uh, you really covered um, what WWRC is doing from a uh, macro lens. And um, here is just kind of a snap snapshot, an example of um, one of the curriculums activities that will be integrated into the civic engagement program. Um, so we actually have done some work around uh, GOTV and community engagement um, stuff, but uh, this power mapping is, is kind of a visual representation of um, kind of uh, organizing law info and um, understanding the priorities and goals of uh, elected officials. And um, this kind of activity is just is kind of to uh, create a clear sociopolitical vision 
um, while, you know, uniting um, very dividing uh, conflicting parties like, uh, you know, here are some allies, but these are also like opposition groups um, in the work of social justice. Um, so I specifically focused on that concept of counter surveillance. Um, you know, obviously their warehouse workers are, you know, tracked and it's more of like a, a very uh, dil diligent thing. But um, my kind of take was um, how can we subvert that um, while addressing community needs? And uh, it's taking from a reductionist model. So that's very individualized and, you know, very capitalist normative notions and to a reactionary model. So that's more preventive um, and holistic. And so how can we do that while um, staying within scope um, within capacity of the uh, organizing group. And that's, you know, culturally relevant and responsive. Um, so there, it, uh, my, my supervisor, uh, Vero, um, shared with us this graphic uh, when we were kind of um, talking about the membership program and possibly, um, you know, some t-shirts. And so it's an upside down uh, forklift and it says organize uh, to Rabia, which means organize your rage. And uh, Brenda, our other supervisor, um, really uh, talks about um, how can we focus on um, not just mobilizing, but also from mobilizing to moving into building, you know, organizational uh, long-term lasting uh, relationships after contacting. So it's like taking these emotions, stress um, and converting that into healing. So it's not just, you know, uh, Democrats versus Republicans or something, but it's actually listening to worker needs and identifying these issues. And so how can we outreach um, in a way that builds curiosity um, and sets expectations for accountability? Because, you know, WWC is con uh, conducting many resistance events, but how do we do that in a way um, you know, that uh, kind of, that activism kind of solidifies, um, you know, self-determination and power. So my methodology was actually talking to uh, three different professionals. Um, so one is actually within the logistics uh, food industry. Um, another one's actually a professor at CMC that looks more at, um, you know, human resources and organizational leadership. Um, and then I also talked to um, Adelina, who is a uh, professor and PhD at UC Denver um, and uh, kind of specializes in Latinx sociology and law, um, really provided also an intergenerational lens uh, because uh, she's a daughter of immigrants and in the agricultural industry. And there's definitely a continuity of, you know, uh, wage thefts, labor exploitations, unsafe conditions that are uh, transfer over to the warehouse worker industry in Southern California. Um, and so I just want to share a uh, quote, um, actually so a little audio bite um, from Lacey. It's like ass backwards right now where you have people shoving like the numbers and the reports mm -hmm. and this and that down mm -hmm. your throat. Like, it's so funny. All the little things that I, that stick with me, she taught me like always about the why behind the what, right. you know, the whole people service profit thing, how your people feed into your service, which ultimately feeds into your profit. So it's like ass oh, um, so th that was just an example of um, some of the data findings uh, that I discovered. And really, um, you know, so when I asked Lacey about, you know, what her stress level using this diagram was, it, it was a seven. And there's a common thread of situational stressors, um, like as listed here, you know, um, particularly for women, like sexism, there's also like high turnover rates, um, unreasonable hours, unsafe conditions. And so um, what are the coping mechanisms essentially um, that can be extracted from this? And so one of hers is actually to be less emotional because as a female, you know, it, it's shown as like over-invested. Um, and when she was talking about she, she was actually talking about um, her favorite boss who uh, she refers to as a power lesbian um, because it kind of gave that example of like mentoring um, while focusing on values of uh, people service profit. So, you know, you can't remove yourself from these triggering situations, um, but also there's, how can you show compassion, understanding, um, you know, while also being, you know, showing, expressing value and gratitude for your workers, but there's such just like a diverging interest um, from companies to, you know, actually invest um, bottom up rather than top, top down. Um, but her managing style and it definitely centers uh, uh, bottom up. Um, and so this is just kind of uh, 
kind of what Rigioso is saying that, you know, there shouldn't be a nonprofit catering to outsource problems. There should be systematic internal change, uh, but there is conflicting interest between parties. Um, so this kind of graphic is a way to show like activities, strategies, practices that can be modeled into case studies. Um, and so Vero uh, really uh, explained this idea of, you know, how do we build defense and survival within the capitalist system? Um, because you're, you know, at the end, you're, you can't, even if you're an empowered individual, you're still at um, a workplace. And so this graphic is just kind of um, what I modeled uh, based off, oops, sorry, um, kind of like a shield. So that's the idea of defense and protecting. Um, and then this is like the healthcare symbol. Um, and then kind of uh, how to uh, take into account individual and uh, collective needs um, and kind of address them uh, in these four quadrants um, in a way that is, you know, holistic, restorative. Um, and so it's like treating uh, immediate individual symptoms or how can you do that systematically um, while also, you know, attacking um, from collective uh, ways. And so this kind of brings me to my uh, last point, which is um, how can we sustain the longevity of this work? And, you know, although I talk to professionals, it's we really need to be holding space for workers to reclaim their autonomy, um, for them to have hope and healing. And um, how can they be the designers and decision makers um, to uplift and, and kind of reclaim their autonomy and have a co-creative community space? Um, and, and a way that you know, cares and uplifts for livelihoods that's um, not just a worker, but a community member. Um, and so it's not just investing in the movement. I mean, it's not just investing in immediate needs, but it's actually investing in, in the movement when we're addressing these concerns. Um, but of course, also, you know, we have to note that um, although there, there could be coping mechanisms, there, uh, that is also kind of building a higher tolerance for abuse as well. So how can we build resilience? I think this raises the question of how can we build resilience while calling out accountability for the systems that are forcing them to build resilience? And I think Layla will be covering that in her uh, next project. So uh, thank you guys for joining us on a Friday night. Um, I have had... I have grown in ways that I have not been uh, even aware of. So I'm so grateful to have worked with Morgan, Vero, Layla, uh, Brenda, and I think they're all on the call right now. And of course, um, from learning from my classmates and the amount of investment and care they have put into their projects. So thank you. I knew Vero was going to drop an F-bomb at some point. I'm glad we just got that out of the way. You did great, Aditi, and that was wonderful. Um, and we'll pass the mic to Layla now. Okay, lovely. Can everyone see my screen and hear me? Okay, incredible. Well, today I will be talking about the power that healing resistance, sorry, healing resilience has within community resistance and collective resistance efforts. And more specifically, I looked at the research question, what methods and practices of healing and well-being support best mirror the values, culture, and direction of WWRC? And what are the primary barriers and considerations to take into account before implementing healing practices? So before I delve into my data findings, I find I just think it's very important to talk about structure and methodology. Um, and just to note that I am a student, um, I am an organizational studies major, and I did not have a lot of experience with healing and well being practices, um, nor community organizing before this. So hence my massive literature review, um, I felt the need to really dig into a lot of theory and a lot of findings before I felt it appropriate to suggest any healing practices. And with this, because I'm an organizational studies major, um, I have found that I can use some of the skills that I'm learning in OS, such as identifying power dynamics, workflow structures, um, and as well as like hierarchical um, tendencies within organizations to, understand and develop what the organizational ecosystem is like 
before I delve into suggesting anything else. So I divided my data findings up into two parts. Part one, which was based on all my field notes and is the inner circle. And then that was just identifying um, what the community culture values, practices, and direction WWRC is going. And then part two was um, identifying the pathways to healing resilience to towards community resistance. And that is using my field notes, literature review, as well as three interviews or one-on-one -on -one conversations I had and a conversation with a healing practitioner that I had. So part one of my findings, um, I found a quote from my supervisor, Vero, explaining the membership program and the launch of the membership program, the goal of it to be to create a community-based network that uses an intersectional awareness and, and community empowerment to drive the mission of collective resistance to be incredibly encapsulating of um, what WWRC stands for as an organization at large. And I think that building a community network is hugely um, important to WWRC, especially looking at the recent organizational pivot that they have pivoted away from being an in and out resource center that is more individualistic um, and more transactional where workers get their needs met and then exit the realm of WWRC to being more of a community oriented organization and, and to have worker retention within their organization. With this, the second point that I noted within my data analysis was this emphasis on knowledge is power. And I saw this coming through the Escolita workers' rights sessions. I saw this coming through the civic engagement program sessions. Just having the knowledge and the understanding of the systems around you is vital to therefore challenging those systems and learning how to live within those systems. Um, the third point that I identified that is important to WWRC is the idea of collective resistance. And this is kind of a combination of both one and two, which is there are power in numbers. And if we can come together to fight, um, our movements are gonna be stronger and we're gonna achieve a larger social change. Um, and I found that within the theme of collective resistance that there is a high, high emphasis on the words of like being vigilant or being, um, or challenging or critiquing the systems around us or agitating and just creating this kind of sense of collective anger that um, Aditi referred to. And I think that is incredibly powerful. And with that, critical analysis is deeply woven into the fabric of WWRC. Everything that they do is questioned. Intentions are questioned. Um, community needs are, in are, in are questioned. There is a strategy that really emphasizes everything being extremely well planned out. Um, and I think that is really central to note when creating or suggesting healing practices. So part two was taking the findings that I found through my thematic analysis in part one, as well as drawing on theory that I found through my literature review and conversations that I had um, with staff members, as well as with a healing practitioner to develop what the pathways are to healing resilience that work towards community resistance. Um, and I largely focused on the theorist um, and Africana studies professor, Sean Jenright, which focuses on healing centered in a healing centered engagement framework, which is a very holistic, non-traditional method of healing. Um, he critiques trauma inf informed care, which is a very mainstream method as being very clinical and very individualistic. And he really wanted to stray away from that. Um, and so the qualities that are within a, tr a healing centered engagement framework is that it's heavily community based, it's culturally grounded, it's asset driven, and it's explicitly political rather than clinical, as well as it focuses on healing the service provider as well as the service receiver. And identified in my data findings that the through the membership launch and this organizational pivot to becoming more of a community based network, WWRC has already hit Jen Wright's definition of um, centering community and it being community based. With that, Jen Wright 
emphasizes the importance of it being of healing being asset driven. So focusing on the well being we want um, rather than the symptoms that we want to suppress. And I see WWRC in some ways encapsulating the same strength based tone when they talk about welcoming the whole human into their environment, not just the warehouse worker that's been exploited and not just them being defined by their line of work or their struggle. They want to welcome the whole human, the warehouse worker that's a family member, that's a community member that has a unique life story. So in that aspect, I really do see um, WWRC following, already following Jen Wright's model. Some considerations that I found is that through um, a variety of conversations with um, staff members is that talking about trauma and talking, talking about healing can be really scary. So a gradual introduction into healing is completely necessary, as well as the language and the semantics we use around healing is very important. For example, a lot of people have different connotations when you say self-care versus when you say coping mechanisms or self-preservation or um, well-being support. So I won't go into those today, but those are my other themes. And what I do want to go more into depth in is um, Ride's fourth point, which is that healing needs to start with staff first to avoid um, staff members accidentally depositing their traumas on um, the communities that they work within, as well as like making sure that staff members know how to set boundaries and um, know where to go for healing support resources. So I'm going to touch a little bit on um, somatic movement, as well as a conversation I had with a healing practitioner in my next slide. So for my final slide, I do really want to talk about my kind of thesis of this uh, work, which is that healing can be reframed and looked at as a radical act um, and that somatic movement can have incredible immediate impacts um, within this. So I interviewed Emilia Ortega Yara, who is both a licensed clinical social worker as well as a healing practitioner in Riverside. And this form, this conversation really informed my overall thesis, which is essentially that healing work should be at the core of organizing work in order to build more long-term forces of collective resistance. There needs to be long-term forces of collective healing and resilience as well. So Amelia was also a former community organizer herself. So she had a lot of really valuable insight um, in, in terms of this field. And she said that while working as a community organizer and now as a healing practitioner, she sees every day the issues of burnout, vicarious trauma and anxiety, um, hyper vigilance, just a swath of issues that organizers face due to not knowing or not having ways in which to heal or to find healing practices. And she sees that as taking a massive toll on both individual health, as well as the collective health of the organization and thus the broader movement. Um, and with this, I wanted to point out a quote that takes this a step further and references healing as, if you don't heal, not healing is an act of colonial and capitalist servitude, is a direct quote from Amelia. And I thought that was, an incredibly powerful way of looking at healing as liberation. And it's when we frame healing as liberation, um, we can really frame capitalism as not wanting us to heal and um, not wanting and wanting us to work ourselves to the bone, to become dis disconnected from our bodies and just to not engage about learning about ourselves and our triggers and how to cope with that. Um, so if we look at our humanity as more of an interconnected organism, we can see that healing ourselves is also going to be liberatory for healing those around us. So I will, I feel like I've gone over time. So I will briefly go through um, the last point in which I want to mention, which is the power of somatic movement, which I heavily talked about in my literature review, and that I think can be a active, tangible step that WWRXC can take. Um, and that largely, somatic movement largely circles around 
the fact that tra trauma and stress can be stored in your body um, and that introducing your body to somatics can discharge the energy that was stored in your body when a specific harm or threat occurred. Um, and a community organizer described described to me the process of your sympathetic nervous system kind of working on overdrive when you're an organizer, your cortisol levels are spiking. Um, and oftentimes organizers are in a constant state of fight mode um, and are unaware of how to release that tension and release that energy to balance and stabilize um, the, that nervous system. So introducing your bodies to your body to somatic exercises, really simple ones, Amelia suggested like a butterfly hug or somatic breath work or meditation or tapping, she says can have scientifically proven um, outcomes of grounding yourself and of stabilizing those levels of um, those levels of cortisol. So I will end there because I've gone over time, but um, I'm very passionate about this and I just really appreciate um, my CEP team that's on this call and I appreciate Tessa for kind of inspiring this research um, as well as my entire CASA class who are just a group of lovely individuals. So yeah, I'm looking forward to continuing my work with WWRC, both Aditi and I um, into January, which is a joy that I'm looking forward to. Thanks so much, Leila. Thank you so much, Aditi. You both did a beautiful job. It's really wonderful work. And thanks so much to the whole WWRC team for being such a supportive co educators with our students and collaborators, co-conspirators on this work. Uh, I'm going to hustle us along because we're way over time. And um, so folks, we're going to have to like tighten it up with our time wise. Otherwise, we're going to midnight together, even though this is so good. I would actually love to go to midnight with all of you, but other people might want to eat. Amanda Gomez, you're up to bat. Um, ICIJ Immigrant Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice. We would love to hear what you got. All right, yeah, thank you, Tessa. And thank you, Layla, for, Layla and Aditi for that amazing presentation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So just let me know that everything is working all good. All good. All right. Oops. There we go. Um, so yeah, as Tessa mentioned, uh, my name is Amanda Gomez. I am working with the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice this semester. Um, and my research project focused primarily on street vending in the age of COVID-19. So um, for those of you who don't know what the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice or who I'll refer to as ICIJ, um, who they are. Uh, they are a coalition of over 35 immigrant rights organizations in the Inland Valley region. Um, so that includes the San Bernardino County, Riverside County, and some parts of uh, Los Angeles County. Um, can you all hear me all right? Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so some of the work that the Inland Coalition does, um, and I won't have time to go into everything uh, that they do, um, but some of the highlights are uh, campaigns uh, such as their Shutdown Adelanto campaign, Vendedores Ambulantes, which is a street vendor campaign, and their Health for All campaigns, um, community outreach and involvement, Know Your Rights groups, um, and then policy, legislation, advocacy, and direct action and rapid response. Um, so as you can see, ICIJ, uh, they kind of have their hands in everything. Um, and as somebody who's done a lot of immigration uh, organization or organizing work, um, it was really an honor for me to be able to work with them. Um, so, oops. So for our, um, for my internship, um, I worked, uh, one, researching the uh, impact of COVID-19 um, on detention, street vending, and ticketing in the area. Um, the shutdown Adelanto campaign, which met semi-regularly. Um, we had a car rally outside of the detention center. Um, I also helped publicize that. 
Um, and then I helped uh, along the place project with web design, uh, biographies and information compilations um, and guidance on a book going forward. Um, the place project is an art and storytelling project uh, that is done by ICIJ, IE, IYC, the Inland, Immig Inland Empire Immigrant and Youth Coalition um, and Pitzer Casa. Um, and so I was able to also join that, uh, that group. Um, I also, as previously mentioned, worked with the Vendedores Ambulantes campaign for communications and fundraising. Um, and finally, I helped uh, map outdoor dining and seating in the Inland Valley region, um, really mapping hundreds of places offering either outdoor dining or outdoor seating to see the impact on street vending as uh, street vendors and sort of brick and mortar restaurants are sort of having to compete for space um, during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, so focusing more directly on research. Um, I originally planned on looking at the presence of ticketing during the pandemic, um, but I shifted to reviewing hundreds of restaurants in the counties, cities, and municipalities. Um, and looking to their approach to outdoor seating and dining and mapping those. So as some of you may know, uh, Los Angeles County just um, decided to end outdoor dining and outdoor seating for restaurants. So um, looking at how somewhere like Los Angeles County versus Riverside or San Bernardino County would be handling the pandemic and how, um, you know, how equal the treatment of brick and mortar restaurants versus uh, mobile street vendors is going to be. Um, so finally, some takeaways of that were that less than one third of restaurants in the Inland Valley region um, are currently offering outdoor dining or outdoor seating. Um, and for the purposes of the study, dining was defined as a sit down order in experience um, while seating was more often reserved for casual eating, fast food. Um, places where you weren't necessarily required to sit down. Um, and so the map to the right, um, really a screenshot of a map where you blow it up and there's, there's just hundreds of restaurants. Um, but it will hopefully help us explain fluctuations in success for street vendors and places to either avoid or visit more. Um, and as uh, you know, the winter comes around and regulations change for outdoor dining, also where vending is even allowed. Um, so that is most of my uh, research. Oops. And um, finally, we did our Immigrants of the IE photography exhibit and book, The Place Project, as I uh, previously mentioned. Um, and I just wanted to throw it out there that we are also launching that wonderful project that I had the honor of working with Lizeth and Tessa, who I know are on this call right now, um, working with them on that. Uh, and we are launching that tomorrow. Um, and I'll put this link in the chat for anybody who's interested in that as well. Um, but yeah, it was an absolute honor to work with ICIJ, um, IEIYC, really everybody who I had the pleasure of talking to and working with um, over the past few months. So. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was awesome. Um, really good work. And um, yes, thanks for sharing that about the event. If anyone wants to join us tomorrow night, it's open to all. Um, so we'll move right along. We have um, our friends who will be talking about the Youth Mentoring Action Network, which is Clayton During and Katie Metchik. So Clayton, take it away. Hello all, um, hold on, let me set up here. Uh, uh, my God. Um, okay, share screen, this one, share. Am I sharing it? Is it working? It's, it's working? Clean. Cool. Good. Um, oh, that's the last slide. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, my name is Clayton Durning and I had the pleasure of working closely with Isabella Chavez at the Youth Mentoring Action Network. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank Tori Weiston-Saradin, Isabella Chavez, Kade Maldonado, 
um, for not only allowing us to join their team for the semester, but also for going above and beyond in teaching and mentoring us on how to do this work. I would also like to thank Andres Iera um, and Danielle Recker for making me feel welcome and for all they do at the Youth Mentoring Action Network. Um, lastly, I must thank my professor, Tessa Hicks-Peterson and Jessica Cheres, um, our program coordinator for making this semester against all odds an impactful and enriching experience. Um, yeah. Um, so now a bit about the Youth Mentoring Action Network. Um, mentoring is central to the Youth Mentoring Action Network's mission, but it is only part of all that they do. The Youth Mentoring Action Network recognizes the power that stems from positive mentoring relationships and utilizes this energy to create a more equitable and just world for young people. Uh, the drive and innovation that young people can provide is not overlooked at the Youth Mentoring Action Network and is valued by their commitment to youth centrism, the practice of centering youth voices at every step of their work. Fostering community collaboration and partnerships is central to the Youth Mentoring Action Network's mission. The Youth Mentoring Action Network also offers professional development to youth serving professionals and organizations. This is all in addition to the research and knowledge that the Youth Mentoring Action Network continuously contributes to the field. Um, it, is, uh, it is difficult to think of a single aspect of our lives that has not been impacted by the global pandemic in which we find ourselves. This holds true for grassroots organizations like the Youth Mentoring Action Network and the people with whom they engage. During my time at, youth, at the Youth Mentoring Action Network, I attended their generation IE Inland Empire Youth Summit and the IE Rise California Labor Policy Youth Summit and numerous meetings with my supervisor is Isabella Chavez. Drawing from these experiences, it became clear to Isabella and I that workforce development is of high importance to our stakeholders and that the Youth Mentoring Action Network would benefit from research on workforce development programs. This ultimately inspired my research question of what makes workforce development programs successful and how do these programs approach the complexities involving, uh, involved with workforce development. Um, so um, my findings, um, to answer this question, I dove into the literature that has been written on designing, implementing and sustaining workforce development programs. Um, to provide some context, the Inland Empire region accounts for one of every nine, uh, one of every nine California residents and has added over 300,000 jobs since peak unemployment in July 2010. The Inland Empire's large population, concentration of higher education institution, institutions, proximity to the Port of Los Angeles and history sorry, of community empowerment and progress evidence why the region is primed for workforce development. In order to uncover what makes workforce development programs effective, I reviewed current literature on workforce development and the programs of which they describe. From my research, I found that effective workforce development programs require recognition of workforce development as a local and state priority. Um, workforce issues are consistently overlooked by policymakers at the federal level, despite being considered as highly important by stakeholders. Federal funding is crucial to the success of these programs, and without it, these programs have to rely on grants and individual donors to fund their efforts. Evidence-based approaches to staff development are more effective than didactic training methods. Research has shown that didactic training has shown didactic training to be ineffective. In a program in which evidence-based training was used to train healthcare clinicians in in-home treatment for families and children, 92% of the respondents stated that the course had it has had improved their clinical skills and 90% reported that they would recommend the course to other students. Consumer agency in designing these programs. It is imperative that when designing these workforce development programs, the people who with the people who will engage in these programs have some say in what they teach. Businesses, while they do have insight into the needs of a specific labor sector, cannot provide insight into how stakeholders feel and what skills they already possess. Collaboration is a fundamental characteristic of any successful workforce development program. There are so many aspects and complexities involved in workforce development that it can be daunting for any single organization to approach. To approach. Collaboration can help lessen the load of the work and broaden the impact of these programs. Collaboration between interstate agency, higher education institutions, in particular community colleges, local grassroots organizations, and community members makes addressing the workforce crisis possible. Um, thank you um, for that time. I'll now pass um, 
the mic to uh, Katie Metchik. Um, how do I stop sharing? Stop share. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to need a little help from Jessica. So if we could share that, that'd be awesome. Um, I was having some technical difficulties with sharing my screen. So I appreciate everyone for your patience. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, awesome. Cool. So, and then I think you just have to, it might just be like that. That's okay. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, so my presentation is on diversity, equity, and inclusion education. Um, next slide. So I'll start with this quote. Um, it reads, here you are in the cycle between the past and the future, choosing to spend your miraculous time in the exploration of how humans can learn from the world around us, how to best collaborate, how to shape change. Um, and that's a quote that I've revisited throughout this semester. And so I just wanted to start with that. Next slide. Okay, so my name is Katie Metchik and I'm a sophomore at Pitzer College. This semester, I got the privilege to be part of the CASA program. With my time at CASA, I worked with two partner organizations, uh, one being the Jewish Collaborative of San Diego or JCO for short, and the other being the Youth Mentoring Action Network or IMAN. Next slide. At JCO, I work directly with young people. In collaboration with the remarkable Gabby Arad, I had the opportunity to become an educator this semester. I taught classes on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, and created lesson plans each week to ensure that the students were engaged and learning about material that was important to them. I taught two classes, one being for students in grades K through six, although it was predominantly second and third graders, and the other class I taught was for teens. Teaching these classes allowed me to apply my learning and hear from young people what they were learning about as well. When surveyed, out of all of my students, um, only one said that they were having similar conversations in school to the ones that we were having in class. This is where I wanted to begin my research. Activist scholars for decades have been researching and finding the positive benefits of teaching DEI education to young people, and yet still the majority of my students weren't getting this from school. I felt so fortunate to get to provide an outlet for these young people to engage in these conversations with one another and create a space where they felt empowered to do so. Throughout my time with JCO, I hope I've inspired these young people as much as they have inspired me. Their curiosity, creativity, compassion, and true desire to learn made teaching a real joy. So rather than speaking for them, I'll let you see what some of the teens had to say. This isn't scripted, I just asked them to talk about DEI education. Um, and so you'll see that now. So next slide. And then you should just click, yeah, there you go. It may not work, you can see. Tessa, I know it worked when you shared your screen. Would you be able to yeah, do? Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah, Thank Jessica, you. So much. Sorry, Jessica, I'm going to share mine. Thank uh, you. See if this works any better. DEI education is really important because it allows you to build a tolerance for those around you and those in your community. And I believe that Katie as a teacher does a great job with that. She allows us to view our own relationships and look into our own space and really reflect on who we are as people. I think that uh, DEI education is really important specifically for me and like people my age because a lot of us are like, uh, LGBTQ and like I'm just in a lot of involved in a lot of this so a lot of what we learn about affects me like with LGBTQ and pronouns and like all like equality and stuff like that a lot of that affects me personally and like people I know and um, I think Katie does a really good job as a teacher because she's very passionate about all these subjects so it's easier to stay engaged and uh, she knows a lot. So it's a very good class. Um, 
I feel like it's important to learn about that because um, you can see what it's like for other people and you can also find ways to relate to them or and find that you're not alone in that way, I guess. And um, Katie is a very, very good teacher because she is also like passionate about what she teaches and she makes it interesting and fun. So you, it's like fun to do. DEI is like important to me because it's good for like connection and being a part of community and just like discussing important topics and stuff like that. And Miss Katie's a really good teacher. She always like include like always gets a like a conversation going. She's super nice and sweet and she's very supportive and I feel like I could like trust her and talk to her. Awesome, thank you. So Young people, as you can see, are learning about DEI concepts at lightning speed. Through social media alone, the amount of collaboration, coalition building, and activism is amazing. And of course, it's being led by young people. Next slide. DEI education is really important because. Oh, sorry. Um, this brings me to my other community partner, the Youth Mentoring Action Network, or EMON for short. Iman focuses on creating amazing mentorship opportunities in a youth-centric way. Through this partnership, I got to attend some amazing events and discussions about some of the obstacles that young people in the Inland Empire are facing today. I also got to meet some astounding youth leaders who are building their communities with love, care, and resilience. However, while that was all powerful, one thing that I spoke to Kade, my wonderful Iman supervisor about, was DEI education for adults. Many organizations look to the work that Iman is doing with, young with youth mentoring and seek to learn how to replicate those beautiful connections in their work. As I said, young people are learning fast and sometimes adults and our elders are feeling like they just can't catch up. This is where my, this is where my work began. Next slide. Kade and I collaborated on what a holistic Iman style training would look like for adults seeking to learn about DEI work. After many meetings and many, many edits, I worked to develop an online course that covers personal identity, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and building healthy relationships with ourselves and others. And of course, in typical Iman fashion, this was done in a youth-centric way. It is full of activities, new vocabulary, videos, articles, and more. This training gave me yet another opportunity to apply what I was learning in a meaningful way. Next slide. I'm so grateful for Gabby and Kade, and I cannot express this gratitude enough. Both of these organizations opened their arms to me and embraced me as part of their community. I feel so honored to have created long lasting projects and relationships with these organizations that I know both have amazing futures. A final thank you to Kade and Gabby, as well as Isabella and Tori for letting me take part in the amazing work you all do. A special thanks to my CASA family and our fearless leaders, Tessa and Jessica, for supporting and uplifting me this semester. So much love to you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Miss Katie. This is Katie. <laughs> so wonderful. Really great work. And to Clayton as well, and to the folks at Iman for continuing to support our students. Great work, everyone. Um, okay, well. We, we are a bit off of our uh, timeline here, but that's because we're carried away with the passion of the work. Uh, well, we're gonna just charge ahead and welcome next Rosalina Ramirez, who worked with our wonderful partners at Huerto del Valle. So Rosalina, take it away. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you everyone who has presented before me. Um, can you all hear me all right? Okay. All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Um, my name is Rosalina Eileen Ramirez, and I will be presenting Growing Together. How can conversations with community lead to healing, justice, and movement, um, which is the research I conducted with Huerto del Valle Community Garden. So first, I want to address what brought me to this work. Um, and as in research, I believe that one of the most important aspects is to acknowledge your own positionality and what brings you to this work. Um, so this is me here. Uh, I'm a fourth year student at Pitzer College, majoring in public health with a concentration in community health. I was born and raised in Riverside, California, a city in the Inland Empire. And for these two reasons, along with many others, 
is what brought me to choosing Huerta del Valle, a truly beautiful union of my passions and my community. So um, Huerta del Valle is a community garden that was started by Maria Alonso, who wished to see her community have access to healthier foods. Um, the project was started with one community garden in Ontario and has now developed into 40 acres of land dedicated to increasing access to local, affordable, and organic food. Um, the initial dream has turned into so much more. And here you can see that um, on the map, let me, oh no, let me technical difficulty, sorry everyone. So here you can see with all the pinpoints on the maps, there are different um, locations. Um, and so here are some embedded images of uh, different programs and sites that Huerta del Valle has. And so this is the Ontario site where it all began. Um, and here is the San Bernardino site where community members came together to paint the Huerta mural, um, which is a replica of the Ontario site. And here is the produce getting ready for the CSA market, which is community supported agriculture markets, um, which is part of Huerta's journey to becoming self-sustainable. And this is the next generation of urban farmers, uh, which are being trained at the new farmer training at Huerta. And here's some more pictures of them um, having some distance learning. And here's a farmer uh, with his produce. And so this is, he's part of the uh, farmer incubation program, which is a program that Huerta, Huerta del Valle um, has to aid in the creation of an ecosystem of local organic and urban farmers. Um, and so here's a, a list of some of the things I already mentioned that Huerta del Valle offers with, uh, along with nutrition, programming, education, composting, donations, and additional community resources. And so here, um, I'm not sure if you'll have access to the presentation, but I hope you will. Here you can click on the button and it'll lead you to Huerta del Valle, um, where you can learn more about them. And so my responsibilities at Huerta del Valle this fall um, was to conduct the annual report, um, which is an important documentation for nonprofit organizations to highlight the year's challenges, achievements, and goals for the next year. Um, so to do this, I interviewed uh, the staff in order to compile the data, and this is the same data I used for my research project. And so by listening to Puerto del Valle's staff, um, I, I was able to hear the narratives that they brought, and I realized that building this food justice movement and healing happens from listening to one another. And so from my interviews, I had the opportunity to listen to many different wisdoms and about healing, uh, justice and movement organizing. So I will go ahead and share some of my favorite quotes. Um, this first one was shared by Andres, who is a Huerta del Valle farmer. He says, Como decía, yo trabajé mucho tiempo en la bodega. Cuando salía de mi trabajo y yo llegaba aquí con dolor, dolor de cabeza, por puro estrés, allí en la bodega, y llegaba aquí. Empezaba, empezaba a trabajar y se me quitaba todo lo que me molestaba y me sentía libre. Todo lo que uno respira y todo eso como uno agarra más energía. And so basically here he says that um, when he would leave his warehouse job, he would arrive at Huerta with the headache from pure stress. But once he began working in the garden, he rid himself of everything that bothered him. He felt free and found energy within everything he breathed in. And so the next quote I have to share is um, from Tracy Kimura, who's a farmer, who's the farmer training program coordinator. And she says, um, when you see a garden in its beauty, it makes you feel another way, you know, because that is the beauty within you. And those weeds are the weeds within you. And when you garden and you do the healing work and you visualize the problems in your life that you're pulling out, it makes it more powerful. And lastly, um, Maria Elena says, Yo diría eso, lo más importante conocerle a la comunidad, porque una vez que uno conoce a la comunidad, empieza a respetar a la comunidad. Y una vez que usted respeta a la comunidad, y cuando se logra esa aceptación, nace la conexión. And here she's saying that she thinks the most important um, aspect of community organizing is having mutual respect within the community. And once you're able to achieve that, you're able to find connection um, to one another. And so here are some more like 
data stuff. Um, and with the data from the interviews, I was able to compile and put together um, the SWOT analysis for Huerta de Valle to highlight some strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and I won't go too in depth into them just for the sake of time. And lastly, um, I just wanted to say thank you to especially my supervisors, Maria Alonso and Arthur Levine, um, and my wonderful professor, Dr. Tessa Hicks Peterson, Jessica, and my wonderful class, uh, Casa, my Casa cohort. So thank you so much, everyone who's here. Um, I hope you're enjoying the presentation. Such beautiful work, Rosalina. Thank you so much for lifting up this wonderful community and, and yourself in the process. This is gorgeous. All right, folks, we are, we, are, we are coming close to the end, but we're not there yet. We have some beautiful work to present. Next, we have uh, Dayana Indigo Slade Bridges is going to be talking to us today about the arts area. Thank you. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Okay, and then how do we go? Full screen. Um, so, can everybody hear me and see me? Yes. Okay, so thank you to everyone that has gone already. Um, everyone's presentations have been lovely. I love seeing what everyone has done. Um, and my name is, oops. Uh, there we go. My name is Zyanna Slate Bridges. I am a senior <laughs> at Pitzer College and I worked with the arts area this semester. Um, the arts area is a volunteer based nonprofit that works to serve the greater Inland Empire's art community. Um, they focus on San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And some of the goals of the arts area are to serve as a hub for academic, economic, and civic engagement through community partnerships with local artists, leaders, and colleges. Um, the arts area also works to bolster the economic future of the region by investing in the creative economy. So this semester, I worked closely with John Machado, the CEO and founder of the arts area, to look inward at the arts area's board of directors. Um, the board is a very diverse group of people with many different talents and ways of investing in the arts. Um, and there are 10 board members in total, but I was able to survey six of them to learn more about their relationships with the arts. Um, my goal in conducting this research was to look at why art is important to art advocates, um, specifically those who have chosen to work with the arts area, and how this may influence the art area's goals as a community-based nonprofit organization um, through connecting threads in the board members' responses and applying knowledge from organizational studies theories. I examined how the arts area works in conjunction with the surrounding community and the board members' ideals in mind. So as I did this research, a lot of quotes really impacted me. As someone who was raised in the arts, I have lots of artists in my family, um, which is part of the reason I chose to work with the arts area. And so I'd just like to share some of the quotes that I got from the survey. Um, so the first question I asked was, why are the arts important to society? And one of the board members said, the arts help guide difficult discussions. It gives a voice to those who are overlooked. It builds a healthy economy. It helps youth improve in school. It builds a sense of place and community, promotes civic mindedness, improves mental health, and is a form of therapy for mind, body, and soul. Another board member said, the arts create culture and community. It is in every single action, tradition, and historical moment, from architecture and music to statues and home decor. How can we possibly create human connection and community without it? Um, another question that I asked was, how have the arts personally impacted your life? And one board member said, everything around me is art. It impacts me everywhere. I'm never unaware of that. And another board member said, thanks to the arts, my life is worth living. 
So some of the takeaways that I had from this research um, is that art truly is all encompassing and far reaching. It has, it's in every single facet of our lives. Um, because of that, uh, the board members would like to continue to invest in the Inland Empire, a space that many of them have grown up in and feel indebted to. Uh, going forward, the group would like more people who work in different creative industries like video production and performing arts to join them as they find ways to highlight and support the artists that are in our backyard. Um, I feel like that went very quickly, um, but thank you everyone for coming and watching our presentation. Um, and thank you to the arts area and to our class. Thank you so much, C. That was beautiful. And thanks to the arts area um, for the support. We are down uh, to our last presentation, um, last but certainly not least. And uh, we have, uh, this is the presentation uh, by a group of students. I will let them introduce themselves and their project. And so take it away, Cherie. Hi, everyone. Um, so Keely will be sharing her screen with you all. And I'll just note while we're waiting that this is a group of students who've been through the CASA program in the past and have been working together ever since. Um, so they'll tell you a little bit about this ongoing work. Hi everyone, um, I'm honored to uh, present No Justice, No Peace, the Transformation and Justice Community Collective. My name is Therese Julia Uwe. I am a student at Claremont Graduate University and accompanying me are Vanessa Reyes, a fellow CGU student, Keely Wynn and Dahlia Parasaper, who are students at Pitzer College. So our research question aims to answer um, what challenge do justice-oriented grassroots nonprofits face and what resources, tools, and training can enhance um, the work of healing justice and transformative movement organizing at these levels. Um, so this project started in the spring 2020 and up until now in the fall, we have been leading surveys and focus groups within six organizations. Um, and we have been compiling resources and meeting with trainers to meet these identified needs from our um, organizational members. Um, and from next 2021 until fall 2022, we will be introducing a cohort training model, as well as creating a practitioner's guide to share these resources with organizational members, um, their movements, and their communities. Um, so these are our partner organizations, which we all had the pleasure of meeting and knowing um, through all these amazing projects that we got to hear earlier. And I will pass to Vanessa, who will be introducing our summary and our goals. Hello everyone, thank you for coming and joining us today. Um, so pretty much um, what we're trying to focus on in our research is you know, this issue around centering wellness in the social justice work. And we realized this was um, sort of challenge within the staff and organizations that we've been working with um, throughout like the different interviews and, this, uh, and the surveys that we created. And we realized that you know, um, a lot of our staff that we've been working with are experiencing burnout symptoms like, like such as stress, um, such as, um, you know, mental health, um, can, like um, just burnout symptoms, you know, it just really impacts the livelihood of a person and their well being and overall the interpersonal relationships within an organization. So we realized that it wasn't an issue that um, so much that they didn't know. Um, it was more of that, you know, they, they, they felt like they needed more guidance and support into actually having healing and well being at the center of the work that they're doing and also to be able to live the justice values in their daily operations, both interpersonally and collectively within the organization. Um, next slide, please. So our goal is to explore and critically reflect on this issue of centering wellness and social justice work. Um, it's also to secure resources and trainings to address the issue 
and to also uh, provide models to support other justice organizations and movements to be more trauma and healing informed. Yeah, so now I'll talk a little bit about our initial findings from the focus groups and the surveys that we did. Um, we conducted focus groups with executive directors as well as staff of the organizations, and then the survey was sent through Qualtrics to everyone. Um, so three th main themes emerged, and the first one is about how staff and directors of organizations are really dedicated change makers in their communities. So they act on injustice and they create and build these supportive and caring structures for their staff. Um, individuals have a really deep love and passion for the work which propels them, as well as traditions of community care and all of which are affirmed um, in the following ways. So organizations were found to really enact justice values in, in their work and their operations. Um, organizations served as a site of community, so people felt close to their co-workers, they felt it was a supportive environment, um, as well as cultural practices of community and collectivity um, that sustained their work. And then the next theme was while there is this individual and organizational intention to sometimes focus more on well-being and healing, there are um, these external structural challenges when it came to the actual implementation of more tangible practices or policies for healing within the organizations. Um, and generally these factors were external due to capitalism. Um, examples include just the severe emotional weight or trauma of the work that organizers do, um, the work and life being interconnected, like a lack of work-life balance, um, as well as just oppressive capitalist norms. And then the last theme that we found was just individuals and participants really voicing their own ideas of how to establish and also strengthen well-being in their organization, as well as possible alternative practices that can disrupt the harmful structural norms. This included some practices that organizations were already doing or what they would like further guidance on. Um, so examples of that included a structural shift in the organization, um, more community building for the staff and the community members um, that they work with, as well as just more guidance for tangible trauma-informed healing practices. So we wanted to create resources for practitioner, practitioners after thoroughly listening to these conversations and what these staff members voiced out. And we evaluated resources that would um, assist staff members to um, and to support them while they're being challenged with structural challenges around. And we created a free list of things. And then there was a, also a yoga guide by Hala Curry, Curry, who's also one of the lead um, researchers. And then for our next, next steps moving forward, we're, we have been applying to grants and we hope to obtain a grant and then have um, some outside, outside people come in to help us with integrate the values into healing justice and trainings and create and go back to organizations asking what's working for them, what's not in order to create resources for each organizations with a practitioner's manual at the end and share these resources with um, all the movements and create collective well-being. Um, and then Vanessa. Yeah, so here, um, we wanted to present a infographic that we put together with all of our findings, our goal, um, our partner organizations, and uh, pretty much like the resources that we have so far for practitioners. Um, so yeah, um, so no justice, no peace. We're really trying to advocate for the integration of wellness and healing in spaces, not just for a, a person or individual level, but also for a collective level to really promote, um, you know, healing as a form of justice. And yeah, thank you. All right, let's give it up for this team and the work for knowing justice and knowing peace, transformative movement organizing and healing justice with our Casa community partners. And uh, if you'd like, now would be a great time to take yourself off mute and just give it up for all the presentations for all the students and all the community work. You are all doing beautiful, excellent work. Um, Woohoo! Thank you, Rosalina, for that. Uh, I just want to say again, just how, well, first of all, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'm putting in the chat our link to our CASA website if you would like to see these presentations. Students, make sure that your most updated presentations are to Jessica and Jessica and Jackie will help us get the presentations and this recording up on our website next week. So anyone who wants to check it out can. Um, but I just really want to say, as you can tell, like these students have worked so hard 
And our community partners have been so phenomenal, as I said, in being co-educators and co-conspirators with us to, to work on social change. And I am so blessed and honored to be a part of this program with you all and just really appreciate the, inc the incredibly hard work and passion and dedication that's gone into this. And the time when the world seems on fire, like we're more on fire, but with love and justice um, rather than chaos and despair. So I'm into that. Um, anyone want to make a final comment question? Um, Jessica, I don't know if you want to say anything or any of the community partners or any questions. This is the, the last moment before we, we knock off for the night. I'm just so proud of everybody. <laughs> it's beautiful. I don't know. You guys just amaze me. Yeah, I just like that. Uh, the, the arts area has been really honored and proud all these years, being a community partner with CASA. And just on a personal note, I really, as a professor myself, I love being able to work with the students from Pittsburgh. So uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Thanks, John. Anyone else? We had a lot of shout outs in the, in the chat. I think today was probably the most participation from parents we've ever had. That was rad. I loved having people's family members on the Zoom with us, which we don't usually get to do when we're in person, um, and all the friends and folks that came to support. Um, so thanks to all the, to the allies and friends and family out there for being here with us tonight. Any final words? All right. Great work, you everybody. I hope you sleep well tonight, even though I know you won't because you're still working on your papers, but I still hope you sleep well eventually and know that you are so loved and um, appreciated for your good work. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Take everyone. Care. Thank you. Thanks, Scarlett, for joining us. Thanks, all our community partners, for being here. Thanks, students. Thanks, especially. That was so cute for you. So oh my God, they heard you say that. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Oh Take care.